do you just do one big group hug? Right? I mean, if I get, I, I love you, and I would love to just do one big group hug, but that's really awkward and weird. So I don't know how we would do that. Uh, but hi. <laughs> I, and it is so awesome to be standing anywhere. <laughs> Especially here. This is fantastic. So I'd like to welcome you uh, and also welcome everyone that's watching online in our video venues. We are in part 16 of our Being Jesus series, and today's message is entitled A Rising Morning Star. We're going to dive right into it. We have a little bit of scripture that's going to be on the screens. We have some that we're going to be turning to together. So if you have a Bible, you might want to get that ready and have that on your lap. If you take notes, that's great. If you're new, I talk fast. And so that makes everything a little more difficult. So I'm usually posting uh, notes out there online so that you'll have an opportunity to see some of the background on things that I did talk about or even things that I didn't. Uh, I merely want to tell you this. I'm going to be doing some updates on the city to give you an idea on where I'm at. I don't want to take all that, that time right now other than the fact that Tuesday was breakthrough day. Tuesday was a day that I finally felt normal. And so it was about just around 40 days of challenge. And so on Tuesday, I was like, man, I just feel like, like normal. And I was all fired up, right? Because they're like, well, do you feel really good? No, no, no. I just feel normal. And that's awesome. So uh, when you do have challenge, it's just nice just to feel regular, you know? So obviously not everything is perfect and easy, right? I mean, we all got real life. But the bottom line is, is God broke through. God had mercy on me. God sustained me. And he's allowed me to come here and deliver a message to you. And to me, that's awesome. So I'm ready to go. It is good, good, good. All right, let's, let's talk about something real quick, and that is the idea, are we drawing attention to Jesus? Are we drawing attention to Jesus in good times and bad times? And if you are not, if you are still challenged as a believer who uh, wants to be undercover, right? You kind of want to believe in Jesus, not quite sure everybody else should know about your personal business, uh, I, I got a challenge for you, and that is... One of the things that we were built and made to do is to be salt and light and make Jesus famous. So are we doing that? And if we are not, the question is, why? Is it because of unbelief? Do you really not believe what the Bible says? Is it that you would say, well, there's a lot of different opinions out there. I don't exactly want to share with my neighbor an opinion uh, that's one of many. I don't want to hassle them. Is that is it unbelief why you are so quiet in your faith? If we were to call to raise him up, to magnify him, to uh, exalt him, then why are we not doing that more in our workplace, in our school, in our homes, things like that? Why is it still undercover? As I was reflecting on the message, I thought of this phrase. I thought, if you think Christianity is the best way to die then you'll only share in dire need. Meaning if you only think it's a really about a heaven ticket, then you would never express it to a neighbor unless they were in serious trouble. Then what happens is one of our friends uh, would be very ill and on the edge of death, and then suddenly we start scrambling. And we go, oh, I, I've never shared Jesus with them. And we get into a bit of a panic place to be able to say, I better get to them before because I don't want them to leave this world without. Now, if you think Christianity is the best way to die, that's the only time you'll share them. If you believe that Christianity is the best way to live, you'll share them today. Big difference. I, is it only something that we should have before we check out? Or is it something that is actually enhancing and the very reason for our reality? If, it, if Jesus and us being built for him and living with him and God connecting with mankind, then why would we not want to draw attention to him right here, right now, so they can have abundant life? Uh, we're kind of ripping other people off in that regard because they 
desperately need Jesus. They want to have the hope that you have. They want to have the help that you have. I, don't know, I do not know how I would have gone through the last 40 some odd days without Jesus. I don't quite know what that would have looked like. It would have been horribly miserable beyond what I was already experiencing. So I would not want that for my neighbor uh, uh, Trevor. I would not want that for my neighbor Gina. I would not want that for uh, Mike and Laura across the street. I would not want that for um, you know any of them right? I mean, I could go through the whole neighborhood and let you know. I don't want them suffering alone. I don't want them hurting alone. I don't want them not a part of a community. That would, that would break my heart. I want them to be vibrant and alive right now. The other thing is this. Is your life drawing any attention? What we are going to talk about today is Jesus drew an awful lot of attention, and I just want to ask you why you're not. Because discipleship, by definition, means duplicating the master. So if he was grabbing attention, how come you are not? Why is your life not marked out by other people going, man, something's a little different about that person? How come they're not asking you the questions? Why is it that you feel the need that you have to start every conversation about God? Why aren't they starting the conversation about God? Is there something that is in you that is, that is causing them to go, wait a second, there's a mismatch. There's something that even though your life keeps blowing apart, there's something in you that is, that is joyful at a core, and I want that. Why are our lives not drawing more attention? Now, we know that Jesus drew attention both positively and negatively, right? We know that a lot of times people didn't like him. All right, so let me ask you, how come people don't hate you more? <laughs> how come they're not agitated by your lifestyle? Why are they not bothered by the fact that they go, oh man, there's that person comes, they're going to ask to pray for me. I hate that. I hate that. It's so awkward, right? How come there's not more of that happening in our lives? Why are we not more agitating to the world. It, it's fascinating when the world is completely cool with a whole bunch of Christians. You're kind of like, well, why is that? That's kind of weird. Why are they, if, if we do honestly believe in completely opposing realities, why is there not more crash? Why is there more, not more agitation? Why is it the world goes, oh, Christian, yeah, whatever, I know them. Why can they dismiss us? That's weird. It should be a problem for the world if that makes any sense. The fill in the blank, if you have one of those, maybe in one of our uh, sanctuaries, is this. Extraordinary lives draw attention. Extraordinary lives draw attention. Now, understand, when I say that, I don't mean you need to be flashy. I don't mean you need to be extraordinary. I mean you need to follow Jesus, and he's extraordinary, and that makes it odd. That's all I'm trying to say. It's not that you need to work harder or do more and be more exhausted. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is by nature of following Jesus, he is odd normal. He is extraordinary, extraordinary. That's kind of the point. So if we're living like him, we should be drawing attention because extraordinary lives always draw attention. What makes the news? But odd. Normal doesn't make the news. Odd makes the news. So it always captures attention. And that's exactly what we're going to see Jesus do today in our passage. Let me give you a real quick recap. Last time we were together, Pastor Matt shared with you, and that was always designed that he was going to teach. Unfortunately, I was not able to be at Boss, uh, based side of South Sacramento last week because of the stuff I was going through, so that was very unfortunate. I do have another time to get a chance to be with him uh, in a number of weeks, but I wasn't able to be there. But Pastor Matt shared with you the stories on authority, that Jesus, at the very word, he didn't have to be in the room. He didn't have to be touching the person. He said the word, and the person was healed. As a matter of fact, because of that story, I heard someone teach recently. They said, because we know that with a thought and a word, Jesus can heal, if he ever does anything more than that, there's something else in the story. There should, he doesn't need to do any of the other pieces. He only needs to think the thought. So if he ever says something, does something, touches something, interacts with something, there's actually an additional meaning brought into the story. Does that make sense? 
Uh, the other thing that I found fascinating, I don't know how much Pastor Matt uh, referred to it because I haven't listened to the audio yet. I actually read his notes. I read his manuscript. But I, I, I check up on the guy, right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't know how much he addressed it, but it was fascinating that that is one of the progressive healings in Scripture. It says, and when did he begin to get better? Now, that normally you hear the word immediately, or you hear the word and instantly he sprung up and he was fine. This one says, when did he begin to recover? Well, that's a very odd phrase. What do you mean begin to recover? And it talked about, well, his fever broke here, but it didn't say that he was fine yet. He was recovering. So there, there's a lot of different oddities that get into play in those. So he not only told you the story about healing from a distance, he told you the story about a demon-possessed man in the synagogue, right? And in, 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 you're going, man, why are there so many demon people in the church? I don't know. If there was anywhere that I would be if I was a demon, it wouldn't be hanging out in anywhere near a church, right? I, I, had a, I had a totally inappropriate joke. I was about to drop right there about something else. All right. This is called self-editing and a filter. Some of us need more of that. So I, I just had to stop myself before I got myself into trouble. All right. I was going to talk about where demons are, and it's just not great. Okay. So, <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> let's go back to him. Uh, Jesus becomes famous in our stories. He becomes known. And, and I know sometimes we sing worship songs about making Jesus famous, and it sounds weird. I have a, a little bit of an oddity when I sing those lines because it almost sounds cheap where you go, oh, that person's famous, and then they kind of flame out. Um, famous merely means well-known. And so we want to make Jesus well-known. That's the only way I'm using the phrase famous. I have the same oddity when we sing the song about Jesus being a friend. That feels so weird to me because it feels diminishing when, in fact, he used the phrase himself. I call you friends. And he was trying to explain an intimate connection, but it feels weird because I think of him as high and lifted up. I think of him as a king. I think of him, he's always massive. And to say that he's a friend, I'm like, well, sometimes I'm not nice to my friends. So I don't know if I want to lower him to that. He was trying to say it was important. So in the same way, the phrase famous does apply here because Jesus is now gaining a bigger audience. More and more people are drawn to him. We are going to grab a couple different stories to show you how big of a deal Jesus had become in the nation of Israel. We need to balance the beautiful gift of attraction and also missional living. The Bible says that we are to be exhibiting the light of that is on a hill, right? And the idea of the light, you can go to it. It's a beacon calling you. There is a certain degree where people should be drawn to you because they know that you know the one that fixes it, right? So there should be a balance in our lives of attraction and also going out. That's missional living. A lot of people argue, especially in the church, well, should we draw people to the church or should we go out to the people? The answer is, Yes, of course, right? That's the balance, that should there be people wanting to clamor to the church because there is healing and help and hope and love and concern and community? Yeah, of course people should want to flock into the church if we're operating in a Christ-like manner. That should be drawing people like a moth to a flame, except for flames kill moths. But the, the idea, I always thought that was a weird phrase. Uh, they should be wanting to come in, but at the same time, it is our mandate to go get them. To go out there and be where they are and live where they live and talk where they talk and hang where they hang. That's the idea, is that we need to be going out, but there's always that balance. You're going to watch that happen right here, right now. Let's go ahead and throw the first scripture on the screen as normal. We will have kind of a uh, blended gospel scripture key there at the top where you, we are only going to be dealing with Matthew and Mark um, in this particular portion, but Matthew is in orange and Mark is in green, if you get a chance to see that. So let's take a look at this. It says, and he went throughout all Galilee. Galilee in the map of Israel is the north. So he went all throughout the entire region. We always think of Galilee as just a town. It is actually a big 
region up there, teaching, helping them to understand in their synagogues. Something that we cannot divorce is we have a Jew who is the king of the Jews talking to the Jews. Where's the appropriate place to begin? Where is already a set up place to talk? That's in the synagogues. You cannot take Jesus out of the Jewish environment and still understand why he said what he said and why he did what he did. So let's try not to make Jesus too American and pull him out of context. That's dangerous, all right? So we need to remember he is a Jew. He is the Messiah of the Jews. He is the king of the Jews. So sure enough, he began in Israel and he began with the Jews. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming. Proclaiming means you're not trying to explain, you're just talking about what is. That's the difference between teaching and preaching, right? Preaching is kind of that where I get into it and I go, this is how it is, and there's some power behind it, and I'm just telling you this is a fact to me. Now, if I'm trying to explain it and argue it and kind of go through things, then I'm teaching. So that's why I'm a preacher teacher, right? In the same way, Jesus did that here. He went through teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This is very critical that we understand this line. And he was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. That was a phrase that was not unusual to them. Rome used it all the time. In other words, if you would get the front page of the paper, it would basically say this, what is the good news concerning the kingdom of Rome? What is the gospel? What is happening that's new and different in our kingdom today? That's what it would mean. So they would think about this and go, all right, Oh, you're going to give us new information about the Roman kingdom. And Jesus said, no, I'm going to give you new, brand new information about the kingdom of God. But it's still kingdom news. It's still brand new. Let me share with you the exciting good news, the great changes that are breaking out all across the world because the Messiah is here. That's what he means. And he was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing Every, now this is a big debate, do we mean he was healing every or every type of? Ultimately, it doesn't really matter because the power was flying through Jesus so powerfully. Thousands and thousands of people were healed. Um, But what I don't want us to get tripped up on was, and then he went through and systematically tried to heal every little thing. I have a hangnail, Jesus, that kind of stuff. Let's be careful on that. What it's saying immediately is there was of no type that Jesus can't fix. And what we need to read right here and let it soak into our spirit is there is nothing that you are facing. There is nothing that you are going through. There is nothing that is befalling you that is outside of the scope of Jesus' healing. That we must believe. Now, whether he chooses to operate in that fashion or not is the will of God. That's his business. However, do not ever say, this is too big for Jesus. That doesn't exist. There is no too big for Jesus. Uh, There is no prison too thick for him to break you out of. Uh, He exhibited that, and we'll talk about that story later on in our series, where he cast out 2,000 demons out of one person. That was, an ex- that was an extreme example to say whatever bondage you have going on in your life, it's not a big deal to God. He can snap it, break it, change it, whatever, because when he walks through, every type is under his control. So what did he do? He healed. So he went about teaching. He went about preaching. He went about healing. That was a critical piece of his ministry. A lot of people like to go, you know, there's not a lot of healing going on in the, in the New Testament. I don't know what they're smoking, but there is, there is a lot of healing going on in the Bible, uh, especially the New Testament, the Gospels, and in Acts. It was actually a critical part of his ministry, and I'll explain why. And he was healing every disease. That's the normal word you think of sickness, infirmity, disease, that kind of thing. And he was healing every affliction. Well, that's an interesting word. That word means anything that's a debility or a weakness. 
Okay, so I want you to be thinking about what ails me, what is going on in my life that is crushing me or hurting me or difficult, because a lot of times we put things out of categories for Jesus to touch. We'll go, yeah, 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 so if I was a leper, then Jesus would touch me. Yeah, yeah, if I had, but I have a mental illness. That's not what Jesus deals with. Hold up, what? Or you'll say, you know what, I have a relational problem, and the Bible doesn't talk about relational healing. You sure? So let's be careful. What I want to do is take these words and kind of explode them out with meaning so that you can understand what the Bible's trying to convey. It's not just the simple little categories. If you have a headache, if you have a backache, then he can touch you. No, no, no. There's a lot of things going on. Listen to these words. He healed every disease and every affliction among the people. Why? Big debate. Why did Jesus heal? A lot of people say it's because he was trying to explain that he was the Messiah. Okay, I think that's part of it. Here's a critical piece that I need you to lock into your mind. At least examine it in God's word and make sure that it's true. Okay, it's this. Jesus healed to demonstrate proof that the kingdom of God was present in the room. What that means is, is it was a foretaste of what will ultimately be, okay? For example, remember how we pray the Lord's Prayer, Lord, let it be here on earth as it is in heaven. Do you understand what that phrase is for? It means, may things be down here like they are up there. And when they're up there, what do we know about how heaven is? Heaven, there is no more sin, He actually talks about in Revelation, there's no more tears, there's no more sorrow, there's no more hurt, there's no more weakness, there's no more pain, right? And it goes on and on and on. There's no more uh, paralysis, there's no more deafness, there's no more, right, inability to speak. We know that in heaven we are whole. So when we pray the Lord's Prayer, what you're saying is, and God, may you make manifest what is going on in heaven down here on earth so that they look more alike because they really don't look alike right now. That's what you're saying. So right here, I would suggest to you this. Jesus walked into our world and said, wherever I am, the kingdom of God is present. So when I walk in here, everywhere my foot touches, this is my territory. And I want to show you what it looks like when you are under my rule, when I'm running the show the way I want to run the show, and he began to make things right like they were in heaven. Are we all tracking on this? All right? Some of you are going, yeah, this is old school stuff. I, I get it. I get it. Just stick with me. Not everybody knows what you know, all right? Now, as he is making it like this, he's giving a foretaste of when he returns. Why? Because when he returns, he makes all things right. And then we're not going to have a debate over why did this person get healed and not this person, and why did this go on, and why did that, right? We have all these questions and all this frustration. God, I cried out to you, and nothing happened, and all this stuff that just churns in our spirit, that will be fixed. Jesus was saying, we are in a kingdom now, but not yet. I am moving in. I am pressing in. I am making it as I want it, but there will come a time when I'm going to come in with all my force and we will change everything, all right? But that's a foretaste. The reason why this is so critical is a lot of people would think, well, hey, the reason why this happened was because it was merely evidence of the Messiah being on earth. The problem is, is that that stuff happened after the Messiah was gone and the Holy Spirit was present. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, the kingdom is. All right, that's a whole different ballgame. All right, let's keep moving on. We're, we're going through at a snail's pace. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so his fame, now the Bible used the word famous, not me, and his fame spread throughout all Syria. Now that's the same concept of Syria. It was much bigger in that time, but the same concept of Syria that Syria is still a nation that's north of Israel. It's the next one up, all right? So you would basically on a map have Israel up above that Syria, up above that is Turkey, okay? And then you have ocean above that. So Syria is a Gentile area, a non-Jewish area, and that's kind of important. It says, so his fame spread throughout all Syria. So Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the Sea of Galilee, meaning he went to the water's edge. 
And great crowds followed him from the town of Galilee, the area of Galilee, and the Decapolis, which was 10 independent Greek-styled cities in the area. They came from Judea, which is south Israel. They came from Jerusalem, the holy city and capital in the south. They came from Idumea, which was the ancient Edom, or from Esau, Jacob and Esau but now it's mostly Jewish. And they came from beyond the Jordan on the east side, and they came from around the edge of the Mediterranean Sea, the northern Phoenician peoples called Tyre and Sidon. What's the point? This is all disruptive to the Jewish people. That's what you need to know. Gentiles are coming. They're coming from everywhere, and it's a mixed bag. Remember, the Jews wanted their Messiah, and they wanted their Messiah to themselves. They certainly didn't want to share him. And so the whole idea that he's out there, and everybody has an open invitation to come hang out and get kingdom blessings is agitating. He should be my personal Jesus. How dare you guys show up? I can't even get to Jesus because I got 13 Gentiles in front of me in line, right? That's a problem. But he's getting so famous, it's not just a Jewish thing. If he was just a Jewish Messiah, just a Jewish revolutionary, why would he be grabbing so many other non-Jewish people? They know him as the one that would set them free. They know him as the one that has the truth. They know him as the one that can change their life. So they don't care what title he is. They don't care what nationality he is. you got to run and be next to him. And so that's what was happening. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, the preaching, teaching, healing, and miracles, they came to him. I would say it this way. It's a fool that knows Jesus is outside but stays inside. You know what I'm saying? Wherever he's at, you go be with him. That, that's the whole deal. If I'm preaching and Jesus is in the lobby, <laughs> you go to the lobby. You know what I mean? All right. I'm not going to take offense, Okay. I get the, hey, Jesus is hanging out getting coffee. What? I thought it was shut, right? You know, that whole thing. Okay. (laughs) And he's like, miracle. Okay. (laughs) When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. That's a crowd. There's never been a point where I said, Joanne, my assistant, right? Joanne, at any moment, they may all crush me, (laughs) right? I need you to have something ready. That's a, that, there, there's, and, and we have a lot of people. So it, what was going on? Well, here's the deal. The direness of the need is going to cause people to be a little more aggro. You know what I mean? They're going to be a little aggressive on all this. They want to be next to healer guy. And if they are suffering their entire lives from something and he can fix it, they don't care who they step on to get there. That's the aggressiveness around Jesus. He told his disciples, have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him, for he had healed a whole bunch. So that all who had diseases, check this word out, it's not the other word for diseases. This is one of the cool things about languages, right? Check out what this one means. This is how it's described in Greek. It can be a plague, scourging, calamity, discipline, punishment, or divine trial. Now, when you read diseases, you don't think that. That's what the word means. It means in some way, something else outside you is holding you there and inflicting difficulty into your world. That's a a trip. So what is that in your world, right? I mean, that's something that maybe you've been praying about. Well, Jesus is interested in that too. So that all who had that kind of stuff going on pressed around him to touch him. They don't know he has the authority to heal from a distance. They want to go rub the magic lamp. You know what I'm saying? you got to run over and touch Magic Boy because he's got the answer. And if you are messed up, you're going to hobble, run. I mean, this is the most whacked crowd, right? Because it's just like everybody's got something wrong. That's why they're all hanging out there. And so it's kind of like all the weird people in society just all dive on him, right? And he's kind of like, whoa, guys, hold on, hold on, right? And all the disciples are trying to keep people at bay. That's his little entourage. It says, and they brought him all, huge crowds of need, all the sick, those afflicted, check this word out, to squish, compress, crush, imprison, constrain. You got any of that going on in your life? They brought him all the sick, those crushed with various diseases, 
and pains. You know what that word means in Greek, pains? The instrument of torture, disease pains, sharp pains, and the pains of hell. That's a totally different word, right? So you ever feel like that? Like it's a a sharp torturing sense? Yeah, I kind of know what that's like. It says, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. The word heal is a little deeper. Does it mean to heal, cure, restore? Yes. But do you know what the first meaning of it is? To serve, to take care of someone. It means to put them before yourself and to minister to what's going on in their world. Jesus took all the hurting and began to serve them in a way that only he could as he began to express out the kingdom and make them all right. You see what I mean? It's pretty awesome. All right, let's keep going. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, and they saw him, they'd think about who he was, and they react off it, they fell down before him, and they cried out, you are the son of God, and he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Why? I mean, this happened last week, right? In the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. He cried out in a loud voice, ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. Let me give you my, one of my favorite stories ever about demon possession, demon casting. Do you have a favorite demon casting story? <laughs> Got to keep it in your wallet. It come out, break it out like at a cocktail party. You know, those are awesome. <laughs> like, dude, have you ever heard my favorite demon story? Okay. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. Ready? This, this is good. This is Paul and crew there in Philippi. And as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had the spirit of divination. She had a demon, and she could be a fortune teller, and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, that sounds awesome, right? I mean, you'd go, that's the message. That's what they were doing. Check this out. This is fantastic. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very hour. So it's this whole, she's like, blah, 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 blah. And the whole time the guys are like, oh, I hate her voice. It's kind of like, ah, you're killing me, girl. (laughs) Shut it. What are we doing here? We got like demon PR work going on. They're just like, these are sons of God. You know, he's just like, and finally Paul's just sick of it. And it's so funny they had to get annoyed to cast the demon out. Why didn't he just cast it out at the beginning, right? And he's just like, I can deal with a little bit of irritating demon. But you know what? When you go over the line, he's like, I will cast you out. Okay, so anyway, uh, this is fantastic. So why did Jesus shut down the demons? Are they accurate? Well, yeah, actually, the phrases they were using was accurate. Is he the son of God? Yes. Is he? You know, all these things. Why don't you want demons doing your PR? There's actually some main reasons. The first one is you have to do education before proclamation. What that means is you have to help explain to people what kind of Messiah you are before you start yelling out that you're the Messiah because all their preconceived ideas immediately come into play. So a lot of things that I bring to you I have to teach before I proclaim because I got to get you to understand what I'm talking about. You all know that there's loaded terms. If I drop a loaded term on you, then you're like, oh, I know exactly what that means, and everyone reacts off of it. Whoa, 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 hold up. Let me redefine and explain what I'm talking about, and then we can have a dialogue about it. So he's not going to let the demons jump the gun. The second thing is, it's the Father's will, not the demons going, I think you should be the Messiah revealed right now. You know what? You don't get to call that. That's my dad's business, not your business, so you need to shut it for now, right? And then the other reason is that you can be guaranteed that even though they know the truth, they're not trying to encourage it in others. So whatever's going on, there's an evil intention. They're trying to hijack something. They're also trying to say, oh, look, the demons seem to be on Jesus' side. Well, that's going to cause a problem right there. I knew he was in league with them. I knew there was a problem here, right? So Jesus just said, I don't need your help. I don't want your help. Close it down, all right? Turn with me as we close out here to Luke 17, 11 in your Bible. Luke 17, 11, page 876. If I don't preach any given week, I go long the next week. So I'm having a hard time right here. Here we go. 
But I, I really love this story. This is awesome. Luke 17, 11, page 876 in one of the Bibles around our sanctuary. It says this. This is how popular Jesus had become. On the way to Jerusalem, and this is later on in his ministry, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. Remember, they don't get along, but really the area of Galilee just by itself was 200 villages, approximately 300,000 people. So he's wandering around doing a big circuit of teaching, and so he's getting to see a lot of people. And as he entered a village that we don't know, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. All right. I don't want to go into it. I don't have time to go into it very long. Leprosy is described in the Old Testament in Leviticus 13 and 14. There's two full chapters at least on the issue of leprosy. Here's what you need to know about it. Leprosy doesn't just mean leprosy. As a matter of fact, most of the descriptions about what this stuff does is not leprosy at all. Leprosy is a condition you can contract that dulls out your nerves so that you have no alarms in your body for pain or agitation. What that does is cause a problem that if you get an infection, you can't feel it. You can't fix it. And so if your leg breaks, you can't feel it. You'll keep walking on it. That creates further deterioration. And it begins to destroy the body. This stuff is skin irritation issues disease. Any skin issues were called leprosy. They had one big category. You can go back through and read all the gross, creepy stuff that's going on with leprosy. But here's what is such a drag to me. Anything you had that broke out on the skin, they would, you have to go to the priest, and he's like, let me look at it. What kind of hair is coming out of it? right? That's awesome. You're like, what? Gross, right? He's like, is it a white hair or brown hair, you know, coming out of your sore, it's your boils and stuff like that. But here's, the, here's this totally depressing thing. Whatever your skin condition was, they called it leprosy, right? Now, now I have rosacea, right? <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, if you have like eczema, and they're like, to the leper colony. And you're like, wait, what? I, uh, uh, you know, I just, I, just, I just need a cream. You know, and then you suddenly you have like all these diseases because you got thrown into the leper colony. Anyway, that's kind of a drag. <laughs> but they also had all these rules for if there's like spots on your stuff, on your garments, on your leather, on your house, they got to burn it down. I mean, it was just, they were so, ex there were so many extreme rules about how you're supposed to handle infectious stuff that they pretty much just outcast you. And that's what you need to know. And so these guys were standing at a distance from Jesus because the rule was, and one historian wrote, if you are upwind from people, you have to at least be 50 yards away. So your job is to yell out and you have to let them know you're unclean. Otherwise, you're going to screw up their whole world and their whole day. They can't go to temple. They're unclean. They can never go into church. They always have to be on the outside. They can't live in the camp. They have to be outdoors into a leper colony. All this stuff, people are just all by themselves. And it's a very painful existence, right? Just emotionally. They're standing at a distance. They're crying out, and they ask God to have mercy on them. They know Jesus is a miracle worker. How do they know that? Because he's super famous, and they were willing to go out of wherever they were at to try to be near Jesus. They caught sight of him, and they began to scream at the top of their voice, have mercy on me. That's how you approach Jesus. There's not this, God, seriously, another problem in my life? Nice. Do you understand the difference? One is humility. One is submitting. One is saying, thy will, not my will. One is saying, I'm crushed, but you're still king. The other one is demanding and entitled, and there's a big problem there. Jesus resists that heart, but he has grace for the humble. You understand what I mean? And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. What does that mean? Well, the only way you could ever enter society is if the priest gave you a pass, They'd have to check you out, and you had to go into uh, quarantine for seven days, and then you get checked out, and go into quarantine for seven days, and get checked out, and then you had to do all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Lots of washing and dead birds and blood rubbing and stuff like that. I want you to go show yourself to the priests. They still have leprosy. So if I said to you, you're saying, listen, I have a problem right now, and I said, all right, I want you to go to a place where you're going to be embarrassed. 
That's what he just asked them to do. Because if you go to the priest, they go, what are you doing here? Get away from the temple. Don't have, you're unclean, dude. We already know your problem. I pronounced you unclean. So they still have leprosy, and Jesus told them to do something that's highly uncomfortable. Okay, so a lot of times we go, well, why should I have to go through this and go through that and everything? You know what? There's reasons that only sometimes God knows. But he says, go show yourself to the priest. The priest, according to what they've lived for the last, I don't know, 25, 35, 45, 55 years, the priest is going to look at him and go, get away from me, get back to your leper colony, you're dirty. Well, that's humiliating. He told them to go do it while they still had leprosy. So what does that require? Faith. Why does it require faith? Because you actually have to take God at his word. You're not going to turn around and go anywhere if you don't believe that it's legit. That's called faith. Does that make sense? I mean, it's the very idea that you're here. If you came here on your own volition, I get some of you were bullied into being here by your spouse. If you're here on your own volition, that requires faith. Why would you waste a Saturday night coming here? You've already demonstrated faith. You believe that it has value. That's kind of the point, right? And it said, and as they went, they were cleansed. That means their leprosy stopped. Okay, quick question. Is leprosy their biggest problem? It certainly feels like it. If I was to ask you, what should we pray about? I bet you'd give me a list of problems and ailments. What's your biggest problem? I, I don't know. Maybe it's being next to Jesus. I don't know what your biggest problem is, but it's probably not what you're thinking right now. As they went, they were cleansed. The act of faith, remember we talked about what faith means. We don't know everything about what it means. But it was that in believing that God was legit, it activated his healing power that he wanted to demonstrate. That's why he said, go do it. It was the idea of going, listen, there's bigger stuff going on. I need you to know that I'm real. So we're not just going to, hey, let me fix you, and then you go on your way and think that everything's fine. I need you to know it was me, right? It's a personal relationship thing. Not only did Jesus just heal 10 lepers at a time. Do you get that? It wasn't a one by one, I got to pray for you, and I got to pray for you, and I got to go do this. It wasn't any of that. It was a, hey, guys, you're good. Everybody go away. Can Jesus heal in mass? Of course. If we prayed, and he, could he heal everyone in this room at one time? Absolutely. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. Remember, Jews and Samaritans don't like each other. They don't hang out. But the rest of them, all the other nine were Jews. One of them is a Samaritan. Jesus answered, we're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? What does that mean? It means everybody else kept going, and one guy returned, and he happened to not be a Jew. That's embarrassing to the Jewish people because he was recognizing Jesus as more than just a miracle worker. He was the son of God. And Jesus was going, where are my Jews? Hello? All right, Samaritan guy. Do you understand Samaritan guy was unclean because he was a Samaritan and unclean because he was a leper? So he's unclean twice. This guy gets cleansed, turns back around, and engages with Jesus again. And Jesus said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has saved you. You go, well, it says your faith has made you well. Right. In Greek, it's sozo. It's the same word for salvation. What did he really need to be well from? He needed to know God. He needed to know the Messiah. He needed to be rescued and saved. Leprosy was not his biggest problem. The other nine guys are no longer lepers, but are they disciples? You understand what I'm saying? Here's the other thing that's fascinating, and I'll, and I'll try to wrap up with this thought. Samaritans and Jews don't get along unless they're in a lot of pain. You guys know what I'm talking about? Because suddenly that becomes petty and stupid. And why are we doing that? Look, I'm a leper, dude. You're a leper. I don't care what your nationality is. We don't have any friends. 
I bet you anything that once they were healed, they split up again. Okay, here's my point in all that. We do a lot of stuff in the region of connecting with other churches. And when we're hurting, when I was hurting, I had all kinds of denominations calling me and checking up on me and loving on me. That's why we do it. Because when we realize we're all sinners in need of a savior, we get along. When we start thinking we're big and bad, we all separate. We need to stay on our knees. We need to stay humble. We need to realize we don't have the corner market on everything. We need to stay in a desperation place with God. Then I don't care about all the details you and I can argue about. If I'm going to die and you're going to die, then I don't care what that other problem is. It matters. We got to keep our eyes on Jesus because once we start thinking we're healed and we're all fine, we start nitpicking one another. All right, actually, this is what I'm closing with. <laughs> is Jesus good? Please tell someone that. You know what I mean? This guy gets cleansed, he sees he's cleansed realizes, I got to engage with God about this. The other guys were so fired up to be healed, they went home because they had never been able to go home. I get why they did it. I get why they're distracted, but it took them away from the mission of God, and they only went home cleansed. They didn't go home saved. This guy saw it, heard it, engaged with it, and wanted to be near Jesus, and I guarantee you that guy told that story everywhere he went because that's an extraordinary, li extraordinary life. If you are messed up, if you are hurting, if you are weak, if you are cracked as a pod, if you are lonely, if you are distraught, if you are hopeless, if you are destroyed and God has touched you and rescued you, then you have a story to tell. And you got to tell it, and you got to tell it, and you got to tell it. You got to bring it in, in a natural way, into every conversation that's appropriate. You share what God has done. Amen? Amen. All right, we got a short thing to, to uh, check out with, but let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father. Thank you for touching us. Thank you for cleansing us. Thank you, Lord, for touching my life and allowing me to be here, to be able to preach and to be with my friends, the ones I love so much. Thank you for breakthrough. Thank you for uh, just encouraging and being with us and allowing us to soak in your word and the amazing dancers and the whole troupe and their lives and the ministry and what's going on, the singers and the transformation. And, and Lord, they're here to tell their story. They're here to, to glorify you. They're here to say that I once was this and I'm now that, or I'm now this, but I'm going to be that. And so, Lord Jesus, we love you. We give you praise. We know that all good and perfect gifts come from you. So God be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.